This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Great. So um, I see a presence of a quorum. So I'm going to call this uh, meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 5.32 p.m. on Thursday, August 6th. And I will take a uh, roll call attendance of everybody that is here. So say present when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Um, Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. And McDonald present. So with that, um, uh, <laughs> um, we'll move on to our one order of business, which is our preschool presentation. Sure, and I can queue it up if that's okay with the chair. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a really good question uh, asked um, about, you know, where does preschool fit in on this? I Actually, I think it came up at two different prior meetings, and I said, you know, there's a team working on that, and we weren't quite ready to share what the model might look like. And uh, we are now ready to share what the model would look like or might look like. And so I wanna thank um, Joanne Smith, who's been facilitating meetings with the preschool um, professional staff uh, to develop what it might look like. And she will offer a brief presentation uh, and then question and answer. I do wanna note that um, I have to be at a Pelham School Committee meeting, um, same place, ironically, but uh, at six o'clock. So um, Joanne uh, shared the slides in advance. Originally this was gonna be Tuesday, but with the power outages, that wasn't possible. Um, so I'm gonna ask Joanne to do kind of a high level overview because the, there's a lot of text on the slides. There's a lot of really good, clear information. Thank you, Joanne, for taking a whole lot of complicated stuff about young kids and uh, how to meet their needs and, and condensing it uh, to a couple slides. That's not something I'm good at as a school committee is all too aware. So um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Smith um, to do again a broad overview and then we can do more question and answer. Great, thanks Mike. Um, good evening all, thank you for the opportunity to share um, what we've been working on as a possible pre preschool program model. Um, what we found this last spring that providing and meeting the needs of three and four year olds remotely was particularly challenging. And our preschool team of educators is amazing and dedicated and even through their hard efforts and diligence, they found it was not as effective had it been, should students have been in school. So given the, um, <clears throat> what the preschool educators and then consistent with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education the following model is consistent with what we think in person could look like. Um, I know you have the document in front of you and there's some pieces that are givens in terms of we would be following the general guidelines around the assumptions of health and safety set forth to you already in the K-6 document. What our goal as we think about how do we approach this for our, our preschool students in a meaningful way is looking at having the students in for preschool programming up to four mornings a week and focusing in on students with IEPs. Right now, our anticipated numbers are, in terms of enrollment, are um, high, where we're looking at four to seven students per class and five classrooms. It's not clear how many students will actually want to come in for in-person, um, but that was a decision we made in terms of looking at students with special needs and IEPs based upon our obligation to, to meet those needs. Um, consistent with FAPE, which the committees have been talking about for quite some time. So just to, to hit the highlights and things that the staff um, and what we've determined it is important is to look at um, how do we take advantage of the opportunity of students who um, come in and in the first phase, focusing in on the in-person for those who come in and we, what happens in, in preschools, we have a continuum of services. So that's historically been true where some students have a longer program that may entail longer afternoons and, and additional services and some have morning programs. So it's not atypical for preschool to have a mixed approach. And so through this model, we would be looking at in-person in the morning and then remote learning opportunities in the afternoon for those students with complex needs. Um, or for the families who choose not 
to participate in person or for the students who actually medically can't or for some other reason. One of the pieces that's important for us in both the messaging from the Department of Ed and in our own belief system is that we want to develop the, the programming and services on an individual basis, consistent with what's already been artic articulated through a student's IEP. Um, and through that, we feel like it's really important because our partnership and collaboration with families to figure out how to shape a meaningful experience and program is going to be really essential. One of the pieces that we're also looking to identify are meaningful ways for general education peers or peers without IEPs to participate remotely. Um, it's we have a charge to looking at the least restrictive environment and educating students with their non-disabled peers um, as much as possible and to the extent appropriate. So our goal is to, to while we get services started and looking at in-person for our young students at three and four-year-olds, we want to figure out how do we continue to increase the access and participation of peers. I know I'm going fast. I do tend to talk quickly but uh, feel free. Um, so I think one of the pieces that we've talked about as a group too is that just trying to bring in students who haven't been in school for months or new students because preschool is constantly evolving where students age up and turn three and can become eligible for the program over the course of the year. What we talked about was bringing in even a smaller subset of students initially and through phases to help them orient because we just know how much support they're going to need in order to, to make that adjustment. Um, how do you transition? How do you get in? How do you follow? What are the particular protocols? Um, I think it's going to be really hard. And, and I think if you go into the next phase, it, in the next slide, Mike, sorry. If you go into the next slide, I think it really speaks to what is one of the most significant challenges, which is social distancing at any length for preschoolers, age three and four is gonna be really hard at best. Um, certainly staff will continue to work with preschoolers on personal space and hygiene and encourage to wear masks when possible and, and obviously consistent with their individual needs. We know it's not a requirement, but we also believe that it's important for them as they're able to, to try to wear masks. One of the pieces that's important, and many of you may know this already, um, but the staff wanted to make sure we, we were clearly um, explicit about how much time preschoolers need for close proximity to engage in and assistance from staff just to do everyday classroom preschool experiences. So again, the concept of social distancing um, and just prompting students from, a, from across the, the way, three feet, seven feet is going to be hard, six feet. One of the other pieces that, um, again, if I'm going to pass, let me know. But one of the other pieces is looking at the technology for preschoolers. Well, we hit some bumps in the road um, in terms of what's developmentally appropriate and what did we have access to and recognizing we really need to be looking at iPads for students to use. Um, and in consultation with Jerry Champagne in the IS department, looking to purchase those for the students with IEPs and to look at different platforms that might help those students engage more readily. Um, Seesaw, Classroom Dojo, et cetera. Um, so we're pursuing that with the IS department. And I think because we know, interestingly enough, I think you all know, or our general experience is, is that students tend to be a little bit more facile with technology than we are. Um, and what we want to do is if we're in this in-person phase, what we'd like to do is actually seize the opportunity to use the devices with the students in school to really um, prepare them and show them and make sure they're comfortable and oriented to it. So when we have to pivot or shift, or if there are services that take place outside of the uh, preschool day in school, that we're able to do that with a higher degree of success. And I think um, obviously preschoolers share materials. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how do we how do we adjust and reduce materials in a preschool classroom? I don't know how many of you have been in one in the last few years, but they're usually material dense because they're highly stimulating, engaging, and they serve multiple um, purposes. 
So we're trying to determine what can we take out, what can we sh reduce how we share between. And so we, what we wanna do is fewer students to share within even the same class, but that will be hard. Um, and how, how are we going to clean? Um, because it's very much a hands-on environment. The other piece that, and this was taking place to a degree prior to the end of the, the past school year, but what we wanna do is, is create, put this in place as a regular occurrence where regular meetings will be scheduled with families and service providers so that we can really work on communication, collaboration, and consultation. Because what we would like to see is um, how much of what we're doing and how do we support its generalization to a natural setting in the home. And then the next slide, Mike, um, just talks about some of the typical things that would happen in a preschool classroom in the morning. Okay, I tried to go quickly, Mike. How was that? In my, in my opinion, that was that was really well paced. So thank you. I think the other thing I'll just note is that um, you know one of the things that EEC and DESE have both noted is there were a lot of um, emergency care uh, facilities. Um, it's particularly in the Northeast, particularly as um, emerg like nurses, doctors, medical professionals needed. Um, needed to be at work because of the crisis. And so there is a lot of good uh, do's and don'ts that those facilities have learned from an early childhood setting. Um, and, and I just appreciate that. I think the EC guidance as well as the DESE guidance is really helpful um, because we have, we have, you know, collectively, I don't mean we as an Amherst, but there's, there's some learning that happened. Um, and, and even in areas like New York that had the pandemic raging, there were some really um, good safety steps that were taken that made these centers work effectively for young children. So, you know, I just appreciate that we've gotten some really clear guidance um, on these and DESE and EC don't totally align, you know, but we're just trying to take the safest approach that we can to support our kids and staff as we think about this. So that was just a bookend to uh, Ms. Smith's, I think very thorough, but well-timed presentation. So thank you very much. And see if there's okay. questions for Ms. Smith and, and uh, Faye Brady is also on the line as well in case there's questions for her. Thank you. Um, so I look to the committee for um, any questions or comments that folks have. Ms. Spitzer. First of all, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I think I just wanted to to clarify a few things, and I wanted to second what Dr. Morris just said. I, you know, my my youngest has been in was in preschool for actually the month of July, and I know that we had actually a very positive experience. So if there's any, um, it was a smaller setting. Uh, family-based daycare setting. So it's obviously there are different challenges when you go to a public school setting, but I think um, she had a, a good experience and I'm hopeful that the kids at Carker Farm will as well. Um, I'm curious about what, um, you mentioned that students without IEPs potentially, it, it sounded like the only participation that would be happening would be potentially through things like morning meetings, but those would all be virtual. I just wanted to clarify that because it, um, okay. And then um, second, I think the other thing that, you know, made us have a positive experience, like I said, first, this is, first of all, July was out, all outdoors almost exclusively. So the kids were doing their snack, their lunch, everything except for nap almost outside. I'm wondering at Crocker Farm, I know there's that lovely playground, but given that all the students won't be back, will there be an opportunity to potentially take preschoolers outside? Because it's a fairly small playground. Is is there an opportunity to use some of the other grounds at Crocker Farm, at least before, you know, the, the other phases of students come in? Just a question. Great. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. So, um, yes, we're, to go to the first part of your question in terms of are, will there be other experiences for um, general ed students. Morning meeting was just an example. I think it'll be our charge to figure out when will be meaningful opportunities, perhaps a story time or another piece. I think working out the technology is going to be a little bit challenging between the different environments in the classroom, but we're committed to looking at that. Um, it's something we value highly. In terms of the playground, we've been in um, regular communication with Derek. Derek has been part of the conversations with the early childhood team with the preschool team 
And we do envision that there will absolutely be a way to use the playground. What we just need to do is determine, is there going to be a rotational basis? How will it be cleaned in between? Will it be clusters at a time, pods at a time using it? So we absolutely want to take advantage of it. And there's been some discussion of, is there any way we can expand a little bit further? Not that, obviously that's a self-contained, but looking at other possibilities um, with just the grass and, and having students out as much as possible in a safe manner. Thank you. Um, I, I think you answered the, the question that I had, which was also about um, opportunities for outdoor learning for, um, for preschool students. So knowing um, how much, you know, the hands-on activities in, in their learning, um, not, not just play, but also play-based learning. So um, it sounds like that was your answer addressed that. And I would say, Ms. McDonald, one of our pieces is we're not sure how many families will have their children come in. Um, we'll send them in, um, and that will help shape how we approach this and, and different levels of access. So, um, mm -hmm. eager to move to the next phase. Yeah, great. What other questions do committee members have? Mr. Harrington? Yeah, just a, a quick question regarding clarity, if, if I, or clarifying question. Uh, it, did I catch it right that the maximum anticipated occupancy would be about 35 students? Roughly yeah. it would be 35. So in looking at the, each of the classroom settings, typically our integrated classrooms have up to 15 students, um, seven with IEPs, eight without. Um, and so by focusing on the students and our obligation to provide FAPE to them, it would be seven, up to seven in each of the classrooms, so that would reach 35. However, we're not necessarily anticipating that we will have all 35 there. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? I had one question and you might not have the answer because I, I understand it depends on how many family, families choose to send their preschool um, children to, to in-person learning. Um, so it, it may not be answered, but I, I've, I've received the question about the number of classrooms. So in your presentation, you talk about five classrooms. Later on tonight, we'll be looking at a map of facility space and it shows six classrooms. So I was just wondering if that's a swing space or, or what, what um, how we interpret that. Yeah, that, thank you for asking that. Yeah, that is exactly what we're talking about with Derek and looking at that six space. What we know is we have even some of our related service providers who are in offices without windows. And so we're trying to ascertain whether to use that space so that they, if, if our goal is to not bring students out of their, their core pod or their core classroom, but if for some reason we had to, how would we be able to use that space as well? So right now we're looking at it for a variety of options, uh, much needed options, I would say. So we're grateful to have that additional space. Thanks. Any more comments or questions? I'm seeing none. Last chance. I have to scan the, all the, the rows. Um, great. I think. Um, thank you very much for um, for sharing this. And and also, it was it was really helpful to have the the slides um, in advance so that we could read read all of it and and sort of digest it all before before speaking with you. So thank you. Thank you. And I wish you all well. I know you have a lot of challenging um, decisions ahead of you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Um, so um, I think we can, um, we're going to adjourn. So um, I will make a motion that we adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Bixer? 
Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned, and we'll see you again in 40 minutes. <laughs>